Hi and welcome to this video log with me, Wayne, from SwimmingCyclingRunning.com. Well this week we're looking at a book, and I love books, I love reading all books about swimming and triathlon. This book's slightly different, it's the Swim Smooth book that claims to be the complete coaching system for swimmers and triathletes. It's written by Paul Newsom and Adam Young, and it's interesting for two reasons. Firstly, British Triathlon have tended to adopt this system in their teaching of coaches at level one and level two, and um, I coached with a gentleman called Mark Spackman for three years at Harrow Swimming Club, um, and he was at Bath University training when Paul Newsom was a student there and knew him quite well, and actually does rate him pretty highly as a potential coach for swimmers. So. With that knowledge, I thought this book should be something different. Well, let's see if it is. The book actually starts with a nice explanation of the terminology that's often used in swimming clubs and swimming sessions. Um, and that's very useful for people to know, so um, it starts the right way. And it then goes on to explain um, pool toys, what I would call pool toys, they call pool equipment or special equipment, that's used in the pool, such as um, kickboards and um, paddles, uh, pull boys and things like that. After that the book is divided into three main sections and that is technique, training and open water. Um, and after that there's an appendix which goes through an in-depth study of the drills that they particularly like. They call them swim smooth drills. I'll just say that they are drills. Um, they're not necessarily unique although they do have a new take on certain things. Um, they then have a look at specific correction on the swim types that I'll come on to in a minute. And then they have a very useful section on um, session plans where they divide up uh, a session into its neat components, which it should be divided up in, and suggest different kinds of sessions that you can mix and match into a myriad of sessions so you can actually build sessions yourself and take them to the pool and do them. What's clear from the start of this book is that Paul has really thought out his subject and he's tried to look at what currently occurs and find solutions for that, either from things that are already being done or by semi-inventing something that might be useful to everyone out there. An example of that is with his breathing, or explanation of breathing, and quite interesting solution to teaching someone how to breathe out underwater. Now, I've often said in this blog that most of the problems that occur in adults when they come to swim from crawl is because they know without a question of a doubt when they put their head in the water they're not going to be able to breathe. Um, and again, he says all well, breathing is probably 90% of the problems that come to him in terms of swim problems for adults. And he has a very interesting method of dealing with that. And, and effectively, he's absolutely right, a swimmer should be breathing out constantly as soon as their head goes back into the water. So you're never holding your breath and then exploding it out all at once. Because it just doesn't work that way. You actually then have to gulp in a breath when your mouth's out of the water. And the timing, if you're going to do that, ha would have to be absolutely super. Um, and what they say is trickle, breathe out, and sink down in the pool, which is an interesting way of doing it. And if you do just let out all your air and completely let out your air, you will eventually sink. So that's the first novel idea that I found in the book and I thought well, that's quite an interesting thing for people who find it very difficult to get their head around the concept of breathing out in the water. Throughout the book there's good explanation and a good illustration of the uh, examples that he's trying to show, both good and bad. Um, and in addition to that uh, there are online resources that can be very helpful to people who don't quite get the concept from a single snap. And that's well worth use, using, and I think to some extent it's pretty unique in this type of book um, that actually then offers an online resource as well. As a coach, the second thing I found particularly interesting 
was his method of trying to assist people in stopping kicking from the knee. Kicking from the knee is really quite bad for you. You, you tend to end up kicking against the water, um, which adds drag um, and doesn't help at all. And their ballet style kicking uh, exercise I found useful. I thought that's, that's, that's something I'll probably use as a coach. Um, to help one or two people who really do kick from the knee. And it does show that they've really thought about um, inventing, if they can, slightly different exercises um, that will help a swimmer get over particular problems. The third useful hint that I took from this book was an interesting one, uh, trying to stop crossover in the front of a stroke. People who are very hand-centric often come across and people who are trying to swim come across the centre line when they're at the front of their stroke. Um, and the interesting thing on this one was saying, squeeze your shoulders together and that will stop that crossover. And I can see that actually that, if your shoulders are squeezed together, it's very difficult to come across the centre line. And that's an interesting one. And again, I think that's um, outside the box thinking that, that is very useful. Um, for everyone out there to consider if they see that cross the centre line um, as a coach, or even if they're doing it, if they can see they're doing it, um, as an individual swimmer. One area where I would slightly disagree with uh, their methodology is in the recovery of the arm. I agree that you need a flat arm coming forward without turning it outwards, you need it flat, and you need an entry with the elbow high, wrist lower, and hand lower. But what they suggest is when you get to there, you actually point the hand slightly down and then dart into the water, um, somewhere in between your um, elbow and your wrist of the other hand, which has already gone by then. Well, I feel that it adds tension to the forearm and tension to the shoulder that's unnecessary on a recovery stroke. So I prefer a relaxed recovery, placing the hand in, in line with the shoulder, so that you actually have an elbow higher than the wrist, higher than the hand, but you don't point the hand down. The other area where I'd be slightly at odds, and it is slightly um, with their methodology of coaching, is in the catch area, where again, at the front end, they suggest that you tip your hand when you have, you're, you're in the catch position. Um, I think any movement of the hand in adult swimmers, or people who've come to swimming as an adult, tends to be an over-movement of the hand, um, which you don't necessarily want. I also prefer, and lots of coaches do, lots of systems do, a straight arm, for, uh, forearm and hand uh, movement, so the forearm and hand moves as one. You can see if that happens, it's a complete paddle with the maximum possible area. If you twist a hand down, Whatever happens, you have to have reduced the area slightly that you're going to actually present to the water. Um, it's a minor change, but I think it's one that's probably worth noting, and something that if you don't want to do it their way, if you find that difficult, then move to an absolutely straight forearm and hand combination, and that might be just better for you. So, their method's good, their explanation's good, their diagrammatical explanation's good, and their help online is exceptionally good. Where this book, though, is probably at its most unique is in the system of classification of swimmers that they have, I would suggest, invented um, to help make it easy to classify yourself and for coaches to classify people in terms of the errors that they're likely to see in each swimmer. The divisions that they uh, split people into are an Arnie, a Bambino, kicktastics, overgliders, swingers, and smooth people. And that's an interesting combination. I think those six, as far as I can tell, are pretty accurate in their swim types. Um, what I think is slightly inaccurate is this statement here. I'll just read it out to you. Um, it's clear to see below men are more likely to be Arnies and overgliders, and women much more likely to be bambinos and kicktastics. Well, I'm just going to go to the computer and show you um, that slightly inaccurate. Um, and I think perhaps in, in the next edition of the book you could just adjust that uh, because it might lead the individuals um, reading the book 
to come to a wrong conclusion and it might lead coaches to classify people expecting to see more of a particular type of swimmer than they actually are going to see. So here we are looking at the swim swim book of swim times. Um, and this is the graph they show just here. And we can see Arn is a 31, Bambino 18, Kicktastics 3.8, etc. Um, and it was just the next statement that I found uh, where um, women are much more likely to be Bambinos and Kicktastics. Um, I just thought that was odd, given that this is what they say is their split between male and female in all of the classifications. And. I think that the only reason this is important is if someone thinks, oh, I'm a woman, I'm likely to be a bambino and kicktastic, and they're not, then that might affect them as an individual. So let's have a look at a graph I did using these statistics and these facts that I really have no, no reason to doubt whatsoever. So here's the data just recalculated. Um, Using their figures, we've looked at 100% of the population of females, 100% of the population of males, and obviously the overall population that they gave, and that's what we base our figures on. Now, although Bambinos are the largest overall category, with 33.85% of all females being Bambinos, Overgliders are only just behind that with 32.1%, and Arnies are fully 20.4% of that total. So if you add Arnies and Overgliders together, you actually get 50.2% of all females are Arnies or Overgliders. So you're not more likely to be a Bambino or Kicktastic than you are to be an Arnie or Overglider in that sense. What you are likely to be is a more, more likely to be as a female as a Bambino than anything else. But then swiftly after it comes Overgliders and Arnies. And so I just don't want people to classify others wrongly because of an expectation of the overall population of females, which just is slightly wrong. You see, what's nice and refreshing about this book is its original thought. I love original thought. If I see coaches, I expect them to be thinking originally all the time. I expect them to want to do something slightly out of the ordinary. I expect them to be thinking of new things, testing it themselves, then seeing if it works in practice on the people they're trying to coach. And that's exactly what they've done with these systems. So as an individual, I think it probably works pretty well. As a coach, yes, as a basis to look at, I think it's pretty good. But as you become a better coach, you should be doing exactly the same to this system as this system has done to the systems prior to it in that it's trying to be novel, trying to create something new, trying to think slightly outside the box to create something better. My fear is that a novice coach will get into a blinkered situation, so they're looking down these particular lines and saying, you're an army, oh, no, you're not, you're a smooth, you're a kicktastic, and this is exactly what we have to do. When in reality, People generally are on the cusp of things, or they have traits of one and traits of another. Now, I'm absolutely sure that Adam and Paul wouldn't fall into a trap of considering that someone couldn't be a cross-match. In fact, they do say so in the book. And they recognise, hang on a second, this is your general trait, but we need to concentrate somewhere else for a while. But coaches, especially in triathlon, aren't particularly good at being swim coaches and if they have a prescribed formula they will tend to follow that prescribed formula and it just concerns me not a real worry that they will be blinkered and they won't actually be able to look at something that could cure a problem that isn't prescribed for them. Their training section doesn't necessarily do anything spectacularly new um, they do tend to emphasize, as you'd expect, um, critical swim speed, which is the swim speed that you would tend to race at long distance, and trying to improve that. Um, but, like everyone else, they would suggest that a good session plan is made up of a warm-up, a build set, a main set, and a cool-down. That's quite normal. What they do have is quite a nice uh, chart that suggests the type of swimming session you should arrange if you swim two, three, four, five, six, or seven times a week. And that's quite uh, interesting for 
a novice coach or for um, an individual who wants to plan their own sessions and design a reasonably comprehensive set of session plans for themselves. There are very good sections on critical swim speed and uh, working around that and um, uh, working not too much necessarily in the anaerobic zone which is uh, all out sprints and that obviously has to be sensible for um, longer distance swimmers. Again, they're not pedantic about that. They do, as I would say, yes, you do need uh, some sprint work, you just don't major on it, and that's absolutely correct. Um, I think that there's an element that they don't cover, and that's just working at slightly above critical swim speed, which is normally where you will get most gains in swimming if you're doing slightly shorter repeats. Um, but uh, apart from that, there's another exceptionally good section on shoulder injuries um, and pool etiquette, which is something you don't necessarily see in most books. There's then a section on open water, which is exceptionally good, um, and leads you through uh, all of the problems that you might have in open water, the way to um, swim in certain conditions, how to draft off people and things like that. Um, I think probably of all the books I've read on in triathlon or aimed at triathlon swimming it's probably the best open water section I've seen and in the appendix the um, they go first into the sets of drills that they, they like as swim smooth uh, instructors and I would say that there's nothing wrong with any of those drills I use them myself um, and will continue to use them and one thing I would suggest for coaches not for individuals I think for individuals just follow the instructions you should be okay but for coaches with every drill that you do, there's an isolation, and that isolation is out of the ordinary. It comes with good and bad things. And I would suggest that you try and be aware of everything that's good in the drill, but equally everything that potentially can be bad about a drill. So, I mean, if you isolate a particular element, there are good elements that's going to come about, but there are also problems that that individual isolation can actually cause. And I'd suggest that as a coach, you need to be aware of those and look at those so that if it is occurring, they're not just continuing to do a drill in a poor way, which actually can lead to more problems than doing the drill in the right way or not doing it at all. And then the book uh, goes into details of corrective practices for the swim types that we mentioned earlier. Now, to me, it was slightly annoying having that in the appendix. I thought that could have been placed in the sections that explained what the swim types were. Um, they've obviously done it for some reason. They obviously thought it was better that way. But certainly with a Kindle, you couldn't leaf backwards and forwards very easily between one thing and another. You'd have to go to the index and change and the index and change again. So on a Kindle version, it might, it might be worthwhile them uh, making that slightly different. I just found that you couldn't leaf to the index very well if you wanted to reference something. And finally, there's the section on training sets that is quite comprehensive, and I think they're probably right. You could build yourself a really good set uh, by following um, a warm-up, uh, build set, main set, and cool down. Um, what I did find is that some of them, for generally normal swimmers, and I'm talking about average triathlon club swimmers, they are incredibly long, um, and you would need, I would suggest, two hours to actually build that through into it. Even the endurance sets, you're talking five to 6,000 meters, which in a normal swimmer's um, terms would be a generally a sort of two hour set um, if you're a normal triathlon club swimmer. Um, the fastest club swimmers might be able to get 10,000 meters in uh, uh, two hours but a general triathlon swimmer probably wouldn't. And for coaches um, all of the sets were divided up into uh, rest intervals as opposed to swim this in a particular time. Um, and if you're a coach, that becomes a very difficult thing to control in a lane because everyone has a personal rest interval. They don't go off together, so you're never having people back at a particular point where they're all together. You may have similar speeds in line, but they won't be exactly the same in a triathlon club or triathlon situation. And even if you're swimming with a friend, um, 
th there's a point at which you want to be at the end at the same time and have the same rest period um, or similar rest period, um, even if that's between sets. Uh, and they don't seem to set that. And for a coach, if you haven't got that control in the lane, if you haven't got that natural gap that you can talk to everyone, it does become slightly difficult. So as a coach, I'd slightly watch only ever training on 15 second, 20 second, 30 second, 45 second rest because everyone's going to be all over the lane and you're not necessarily going to be able to control the session as you actually would wish. Okay, so that's a review of the uh, Swim Smooth book by Paul Newsom and Adam Young. Um, it's, in conclusion, I'm sorry it's been so long, but in conclusion, it is an exceptionally good book and it does have some unique features in it that, as a coach, it, it starts making you think in a slightly different way and that's always good, that has to be good. So for coaches, it's, it, it's a worth read, worthwhile read. Um, and for individuals, well, if you really want to set yourself uh, a session plan, set yourself session goals, um, and devise a, a plan for yourself without running into a club or a coach uh, session, then it's a very useful book. It certainly looks at things in a slightly different way. And the open water section is, as I say, probably the most comprehensive open water section that I've seen in a triathlon book. The theories in it, the ideas behind it, um, I don't think Adam or Paul would suggest they should be taken as written in stone. Um, they don't seem to be that type of coach where something's written in stone, it just can't change. And therefore, you have to think of things slightly flexibly. Um, don't try and write something down and only stick to it. If something doesn't work, think about it and then do something else. I'm sure Adam and uh, Paul would support that wholeheartedly. But it's a well worthwhile read and it's money well spent in my opinion. Okay, that's it for this week. Next week we're on to a different topic. I'll see you then. Happy training.